Good now? Okay. Does that mean I fixed it? I think... Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. <laughs> All right. First time or luck. All right. Yeah, I think you fixed it. Okay, so apologies. <laughs> Let's redo our introduction real quick because... Um, that way we can just, when this is watched later, people don't have to watch us fiddle with the volume. So I'm Michael Kilman. I'm Kira Wallstrom. And we recently wrote this book, Build Better Worlds, uh, an introduction to anthropology for game designers, fiction writers, and filmmakers. And today we're streaming, we're going to read, uh, chapter 22 of the book, uh, which is titled Monsters, Aliens, and Evil Androids, an Exploration of Fear and Anxiety. Uh, and, um, uh, so, uh, we'll do a, a chapter reading and then we're going to open up for questions and answers. And real quick, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I sometimes teach linguistic anthropology. Uh, and so it was kind of wonderful pairing with Kara here because, um, of, you know, we, we, di we differ in areas of anthropology. Kara, do you want to talk about some of your stuff? Yeah. Bit? So I'm a biological anthropologist and I specialize in forensic anthropology so like human skeletal remains. Um, I have done archaeology. I've taught kind of the whole gamut of biological anthropology as well as medical anthropology. So between the two of us, we have kind of the, the whole field covered. All right. So Kira is going to start out reading and then I'm, we're going to switch off page by page. Uh, and then uh, we'll open things up for question and answers. This is about an eight page mm -hmm. chapter, so it's not too terribly long. So uh, go ahead. Kira, take it away. All right. It has been stated by numerous philosophers and ethnographers that monsters are simply the embodiment of cultural fears, our anxieties made flesh and blood. We see these reflections and patterns across cultures over and over again for good reason. The monsters a culture believes in often shed light on the things they fear most, and monsters that emigrate to new cultures often change form in their new surroundings. Monsters represent a fascinating blend of the familiar and the foreign easily recognized but alien enough to terrify. Many monsters possess elements of humanity and exemplify the very worst elements of a culture as a form of hyperbole. Their faces may change, but it is the bones, the spirit of what a monster is and the fears that they embody that reflect the heart of what it means to be human. Like our anxieties about death, monsters often follow patterns that reflect our collective fears as a species. As we see in every horror movie, monsters attack when we are vulnerable, in lonely places, in the dark, and in our sleep. They reflect our anxieties about our natural environment when they come from the water or from caves or from the night sky. Demons and spirits come for us when we are weakened by illness, childbirth, or impending death. They target the isolated, the frail, and the young. They can often appear human to gain our trust, only to reveal their true forms when it's too late to escape them. They can lure or entrap us through promises of food, comfort, or money, playing upon our moral weaknesses and greed. Think of how often mon monsters' teeth are discussed. Monsters often feed off humans, either in a spiritual or literal sense. Vampires suck blood, zombies eat brains, dragons and sea monsters devour virgins. Even in modern monster movies, monsters nearly always eat defenseless humans. Giant animals like sharks or snakes, aliens that feed us to their young, or giant kaju that eat us like popcorn. They are discussed with, they are discussed with terms like fangs, razor sharp teeth, drooling, sucking, crunching. When you consider our species, these fears are logical. Imagine early humans, alone on the African plains, surrounded by frightening animals that lurk all around. These monsters were very much real, but they did, they, but this did nothing to lessen their terrors. We were small, between three and four feet tall, had terrible night vision, and no claws or fangs to help defend us. We were prey to the birds and leopards and th that could drop from above. Snakes grabbed us from holes in the ground and lashed out with sharp, poisonous fangs. Lion and hyenas slunk through the darkness just beyond the edge of vision, shadows out of the corner of their eyes. Crocodiles and hippos lurked in the rivers and lakes, making people disappear beneath the surface. Only our, our only protections from the creatures that wanted to consume us lay in the light of day in our campfires, in our culture and its defenses, and in each other. The darkness, the water, and isolation became natural reservoirs for our terror. Most of the world now lives apart from these real monsters. The megafauna they hunted, that hunted us like other prey are gone and the remaining predators are dwindling in number and range. The vast majority of humanity has nothing to fear from large beasts. 
However, our fears remain. A tremendous number of monsters are described as being prehistoric or pre-large-scale human civilization. We find these descriptions from as far back as we have writing. Many monsters that hunt religions are described as being from the time before the deities created the peace and order in the world, or before the, the world was civilized. Writers or weird fiction Writers of weird fiction or cosmic horror like H.P. Lovecraft write the antiluvian terrors or the prehistoric nightmares. It was as though we as a species have some lingering genetic terror of the time when we were small and vulnerable. Coupled with our gifts as a species to spin tales and exaggerate for the purpose of entertainment, many of these creatures became larger than life when they, were filled, when they filled our nightmares. Many monsters also reflect the fears we still face in the modern world, despite our cultural advances in the last three million years. We can still be carried off by disease or poison by other people, or worst of all, by unknown causes. These very real and very human fears are interpreted through a cultural lens. Numerous cultural cultures speak of spirits that will steal a woman's life away during childbirth if attracted by her cries. This is particularly common in foraging cultures where the margins for survival are slim and medical care is an at-home affair. Cultures with a focus on purity, Catholic and Malaysian cultures are good examples of this, have demons that possess the body and cause their vessel to break the laws of society, causing bouts of violence, sin, and general bad behavior. Industrialized nations tend to have human monsters, serial killers, zombies, or criminals that ref reflect the unease we feel when surrounded by strangers, as well as anxiety about dark, crowded spaces. Sleep is one of the reservoirs of fear for humans. Sleep makes us vulnerable as we lie unconscious in darkness for hours on end. Sleep also exposes us to the world of dreams, which are as likely to be horrifying as they are to be pleasant. Many cultures have tales of beings that can drain the life from a person while they sleep, often while the person is awake but trapped in a horrified state of sleep paralysis. People's sleep paralysis nightmares almost always follow patterns. In the U.S., sleep paralysis monsters have passed through different phases. In the 1990s, when the cultural zeitgeist had become fascinated with aliens, sufferers often reported little gray men with giant eyes performing tests on them. In the early 2000s, when there was a spate of demon child films, people began to, re began to report nightmarish children crawling onto their beds as they slept. Sufferers from Southeast Asia tell stories of a horrible old hag with white skin who sits on their chest and slowly chokes the life out of the sleeping person while they lie awake, unable to move or cry out. This monster, the Dabsog in the Hmong language, became widely known in the 1970s and 80s when there was a rash of deaths attributed to it in the United States and Thailand. More than 100 Hmong refugees in the U.S., almost exclusively men in their 30s, died in their sleep from unknown causes. Some men reported nightmares about the Dabsog at the time. Men became terrified of sleep and would try desperately to stay awake. The story so intrigued director Wes Craven that he went on to write A Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984. Instead of the white-skinned hag, however, Craven changed the face of the monster to that of a disfigured homeless man who had chased him as a child, and changed him from an evil spirit to the ghost of a murderer. Stories of night hags may be so common in Southeast Asia of a very real genetic condition, Brugada syndrome causes electrical abnormalities in the heart and can lead to sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome, sons. sons. Uh, this, this syndrome is most commonly found in Laos and Thailand and pre predominantly affects men, with most deaths, deaths occurring between 30 and 40 years of age. A monster that kills men in their sleep is a much more palatable explanation, especially before the era of electrocardiograms, than no explanation at all. A night hag may be terrifying, but not nearly so ter terrifying as the unknown. Sometimes monsters are used to explain a myriad of nebulous terrors, things we can hardly put into words. The Wendigo is a perfect example of this. Territorial territorially, the Wendigo is one of the most widespread monsters in the world. It's spoken of the mythology of a, collect a collective of First Nation groups all across sub-Arctic Canada, stretching from the Rockies to the Atlantic coast and down to the, into the northern United States. The Wendigo is a fascinating monster because it's a curious mix of physical creature, a possessing spirit, and a culturally bound syndrome. While these are slight variations in the story between different groups, the stories all agree that the main features of the, mon of the monster, the physical body of the Wendigo, is towering and lanky with enormous clawed hind feet and paw-like hands. Its breath creates howling, icy winds that blow with such force they can knock down trees and even start tornadoes. Its heart and sometimes its other organs, too, are made of solid ice. 
Its most distinctive feature is its insatiable desire for human flesh, so strong that it chews off its own lips when it's hungry, baring its pointed teeth. Wendigos were once human. Once the Wendigo gets hold of you, it changes you into a monster like itself. This is where the Wendigo begins to shift its mythological form. I can get hold of you in a number it can get hold of you in a number of ways through dreams, visions, possessions, physical force, or even through your own thoughts. If it catches you physically, it does so while you're hunting. Those who venture off into the forest in the winter and never return are thought to have been taken by the creature. It captures you and transforms you into a monster like itself. If it catches you through your thoughts or dreams, it's worked its way into your head through hunger, through hun hunger and cold. When a person dreams of a wind go, they begin to have cannibalistic desires toward their own family. Most cultures believe that a person in the early stages of Wendigo madness can be stopped and cured, although cures are often horrifying enough, but if a person actually consumes any part of another human being, they are done for. There's no hope for a person who has turned to a Wendigo, and the only course of action is to kill them for the safety of the group. There are numerous recorded cases of Wendigo killings in tribal and legal records throughout the 19th and 20th century. The diagnosis of Wendigo madness is found in psychological papers throughout this time as a way to explain a temporary psychosis with a focus on cannibalism. Look at the main features of the Wendigo story. A monster of cold that lives in wild spaces and feeds off of hunger. It drives people to cannibalize their family and turns them into cold-hearted monsters. It will ultimately, ultimately separate you forever from the people and civilization that you love and strip you of your humanity, leaving you to wander alone in the freezing wilderness. These fears are easy enough to imagine in subarctic Canada, where temperatures that go well below freezing and isolation caused by snow and wind can lead to starvation and madness over the long winters. It's the same set of vague fears that drive Stephen King's The Shining or John W. Campbell Jr.'s Who Goes There? The Wendigo is a single corporeal manifestation of these fears. It groups them all into one grotesque form and gives them shape. In the pantheon of monsters, aliens are relatively new. In some ways, they are just a new face on the same stories people have been telling for millennia. Space, after all, is just a combination of those things that we fear. It's cold, dark, isolated, far older than our little planet, and almost completely unexplored. Aliens are often just monsters from this final frontier rather than our own backyard. Many aliens fit the mold of grotesque, slobbering man-eaters or shape-shifting deceivers. Even stories of alien abductions, lost time, and mysterious lights are nearly identical to stories that people have been telling for centuries about fairies, will-o'-the-wisps, and the little people of the hills, all of which can lead you away and trap you in another world. But aliens can embody fears that other monsters cannot. These fears, like all others, are reflections of the time and culture in which people live. Aliens as colonizers, as invaders, as the dispassionate scientists are all reflections of the fears that stalk people in the Industrial Age. H.G. Wells' The War of the World, uh, 1895-97, was written after the author and his brother discussed the terrible disaster the Tasmanians suffered after their invasion by the British. Wells was musing about what would happen if someone did to the British what they had done to the Tasmanians. In fact, there were a number of other invasion stories written at the time, although Wells was the only one to use aliens as his aggressors. Britons were worried that their military might was waning, and the increasing armament of Germany and France stoked anxieties that the British would face the same treatment they had given their colonies. Throughout the Cold War, science fiction featured alien invaders, either working secretly or in open displays of aggression, trying to take over the Western world. Endless tropes of alien landing on the White House lawn filled the fiction of the 1950s and 60s. Change aliens to Russians, and you have nearly an exact mirror of what Americans feared happening at the time. Many aliens are often gestalt consciousness, a shared mind, or a or can manifest as a kind of extreme conformity as the end of the individual, as seen in the famous Star Trek villains, the Borg. We can also look at the, pro, uh, the protagonists in these films and see the kind of qualities they embody and how they reflect the morals and values of our society, like a modern myth or morality play. Many science fiction stories from that time also reveal an uneasiness about the level of violence and aggression the world was experienced. Experiencing In the 1950s, the 20th century was only half over and had already seen two world wars, half a dozen genocides, and the invention of weapons that could unleash destruction on a level we had never dreamt of. 
many films in the 1940s and 50s, perhaps most recogni recognizably exemplified by The Day the Earth Stood Still, featured aliens as advanced beings, beings, capable of great destruction but also nearly miraculous feats of science and medicine, who come to Earth to warn us away from the path of violence. Klaatu, the, even, the alien emissary, warns all of Earth leaders, your choice is simple. Join us and live in peace or pursue your present course and face obliteration. People around the world, after decades of violence, nationalism, and xenophobia, were afraid. They feared that the ever-mounting aggression would eventually lead to a conflict that no nation could win. Quote, I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. The famous words of HAL 9000, the evil artificial intelligence that coldly murders its crew in the sci-fi book and film 2001 A Space Odyssey, demonstrate another one of our fears made manifest, our fear of the dangers of technology. On August 6, 1945, the world entered a new age, an atomic age. After the first atomic bomb was used on a population in Hiroshima, our relationship with technology changed forever, and with it came the rise of a new kind of monster, one of our own making. To be sure, humans have always had anxieties about new technology, and with the Industrial Revolution came literature about automatons, what we now call robots, and other technological wonders that sometimes turned against their masters. One of the earliest examples of modern science fiction, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, explored the potential and dangers, as well as the deep philosophical questions surrounding electricity. Shelley set off a wave of stories about the idea of our technological creations getting the best of us. As anthropologist Willie Lempert explained in his article Navajos on Mars, humans have developed countless films, like The Matrix, 2001, and Terminator, to highlight our fear of technology. Even the new Star Trek Picard series features a plotline surrounding evil synths and questions about the humanity of artificial intelligence and its com compatibility with organic life. Part of this has to do with religious worldview. In most of Western European-based culture, there is only one kind of intelligence, humans. Cultures outside this paradigm, however, have multiple kinds of intelligence. Further, Western fear of AI may stem from the idea that only the Judeo-Christian God has the true power of creation. Ultimately, though, fear of AI stems from the fear of what we, what we do, what we do to what we consider to be inferior species. As we entered the 1980s and 90s, aliens changed slightly. No longer were they brazen colonists landing on our shores. They were shadowy and subversive, often entwined with the murkier branches of government. Aliens and the government branches that studied them would abduct people and experiment on them. They would implant people with tracking devices, create alien-human hybrids, and mutilate cattle in their ruthless quest for data. They were cold, unfeeling scientists that existed outside of human empathy or compassion. The declassification of wartime documents about Nazi scientists, exposure of government experiments like MKUltra, and a number of dubious psychological research projects like the Stanford Prison Experiment were increasingly making people uneasy about science and scientists. The perpetrators of the experiments seemed, to regular people, just like the inhuman aliens from another planet. Add to this a growing dissatisfaction with the government nearly everywhere in the world, and the X-Files-style alien government conspiracy became not just a popular element in fiction, but also an integral part of the mythology of the time period. When you're creating memorable monsters or antagonists in your world, it's important to consider the core values of your fictional culture. Remember that chapter on imagined path, myth, past, myth, myth, and cultural purity? The core lessons of that chapter are essential to creating a creature that challenges the core values of your character's and reader's worldview. And so at the end of each chapter of this book, we have things to consider in your fictional world. And so I'm just going to read those bullet points, uh, and then we're going to open things up for questions. So feel free to... Um, Post your questions now. Uh, it could be about this chapter. It could be about world building. It could be about anthropology. Whatever you like, we'll do our best to tackle it. So things to consider in your fictional world. What are the most significant fears and anxieties of the culture? How does it relate to their imagined past? What keeps people up at night in your world? If you have a creature or monster, what are some memorable features of that creature? How does your creature tie into the myth structure of your world? How does it tie into your cultural sense of culture's sense of purity. Is your monster creature sentient? How are its goals similar or different to your main character? What arenas of culture does your monster most impact? And what's at stake if your protagonist, if your protagonist fails to subdue the creature? So, 
All right. Uh, we'll now open things up for questions. Um, this is the book. Also, right now we're having a sale on Kindle. It's 50% off. It's $4.99 um, on the Kindle version. Uh, paperback is still full price. Um, but uh, you can find it, um, the link in the, the description of this video. So if you're, if you're uh, uh, looking for a copy, uh, now's a good time to buy it because it's half off. So... All right, what are all of your questions here? And again, apologies about the audio issues in the beginning, so. It's also important to remember we're on a little delay here, so. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, in the meantime, uh, I guess let's talk about, you know, what gave us the idea for this book while we're waiting for some questions to come in. Um, so uh, me and Kira kind of were just, we're both big nerds. We both love comic books and science fiction and fantasy. And um, and one day we're just like sitting around having lunch, this is, you know, before COVID times, <laughs> of course. Um, and uh, we uh, we got to talking and we just realized that, you know, it'd be great for us to write a book together because we both are different areas of anthropology. She focused on the more biological. I focus on the more cultural elements. And so we kind of uh, started working on this book. Um, and that was about a year and a half ago. Ooh, that's an interesting question. So uh, Adriana asks, what would... Uh, be a monster to society that's very natural nationalistic. What do you think? Probably a subversive monster, right? It'd probably be something similar to like the the possessing demons you find in very like purity focused culture. So it would be something that like removed you from your nation or like separated you somehow from that like connection to your people. And made you go against your nation. Yeah, so it'd be something that challenges patriotism. It might be something also that is that causes a similar reaction to like xenophobia would be a, probably an important thing uh, to consider. So it's something that that is yeah, it's undermining kind of some of your national ideal ideology uh, and uh, you know some of your ideas about. Uh, you, you know, if it was an American challenging monster, be you know, a challenge to freedom, which is often actually why you see a lot of monsters or hive minds, a lot of aliens, a lot of creatures are, you know, they, they, they have like a queen, a hierarchy, some sort of dictator. And uh, when you talk about American monsters and, um, you know, There's no independent thought and no independent thought. That's another one. So uh, Kelly asks, on the subject of the Wendigo, how old is the myth? Do we have evidence of the myth existing before the arrival of Europeans? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we absolutely do. Um, we don't have it recorded until the arrival of Europeans because most of the nations up in that area didn't have a written language. But that myth is... I, I, I'm actually not sure how old it is. It goes back a really, really long way. So far prehistoric. On this continent. We have some archaeology evidence for it, right? Some, do we have anything like that? No, you mean like cannibalism? No, well, not or, of cannibalism, of just like, do we have any... any... Not that I'm aware no? of. Okay. You might. If anybody who's watching this knows, yeah. feel free to... We definitely to don't know in. everything about this stuff, so... Yeah, I, I just know the, the oral tradition of the monster, and I know it's like way predates Europeans. Yeah, there's also a... Um, um, there's a, a really great book by anthropologist David Gilmore on monsters, and you can just search, uh, search for David Gilmore and monsters, and he he go he does an entire chapter just about the Wendigo. So, um, and it's a great it's a fun book if you're really interesting about interested about how uh, cultures construct monsters and stuff. So, um, Adriana asks, could one culture's monster be another culture's savior? A really good question. Yes, I would imagine so. Yeah, I mean, it's not very much different from, you know, the terrorist slash freedom fighter, right? Uh, and uh, I think actually a great example of that is District 9, right? Yeah. So as he's, if you haven't seen District 9, it's about alien refugees um, who land on Earth and it takes place in the 1980s. So it's kind of like alternate past Earth. And um, 
So, you know, some, the series of events happen and the main character, who's a human, gets exposed to this substance that, that begins transforming him into one of the aliens. And so you see him kind of learning to empathize with them, but also, you know, he comes to fight for them. So in some ways he becomes that, that trope that, um, uh, you just ask about is that, you know, here's a monster to the humans, but to the aliens, he ends up being a savior. So. Yeah, totally. Aliens in general, because there's such a difference, like they, they can be like the, the greater technological force that saves us from ourselves, or they can be the invading force that takes us over. And that's just within American culture. You can see that, that huge difference there. Yeah. Yeah. And there was, um, there was a show, a lesser known Gene Roddenberry series in the late nineties, I think it was, is called Earth Final Conflict. And they have a series of like, benevolent and you're never really sure if they are or not benevolent uh creature uh aliens it's like they sort of are but sort of aren't who show up with this advanced technology they cure human disease they do all these amazing things but then there's still like this human question of should we be hanging out with them or should they not what are they what's the real plan and it um you know I, i don't think it lasted very long but it was it was pretty interesting so uh drew asks how do you address stories being told in universe? How conscious were pre-modern storytellers of didactic elements of their storytelling? Lots of modern storytellers are very aware of that aspect and very intentional about it. So I'm not sure exactly, like, I guess if there's a correct answer to the second part of the question, I would imagine that a lot of these monsters are parables. So I would imagine that quite a few of the creators were coming up with monsters specifically to I guess teach lessons like we find this a lot in Malaysia in another part of the book we talk about um, spirit possession in Malaysia which is actually quite common and the spirits that possess people tend to live in water and they live in areas where water is unclean So there's a a very strong story there about keeping your water source pure and keeping yourself pure and keeping everything clean and tidy. And if you don't, these are the consequences for that. So like I said, I I would venture a guess that at least at first, people were very intentional about their monster creation and about their storytelling. Don't know if that answers the question, but hopefully it does. Yeah, I I mean, it's a question of who creates a story the first time around, right? So if you have, look at the modern world, someone like Wes Craven, for example, who we talked about specifically with Nightmare on Elm Street, right? He's obviously drawing from other places, but if you're looking at someone who's creating, you know, more original monsters, or you're looking at the wave of zombie movies or anything like that, um, you can look at what's going on in the wider cultural sphere uh, and why, you know, we had sudden a sudden surge of, of, of kind of zombies in, in the 90s and 2000s. It's, it's, you know, this fear of loss of individuality, this fear uh, of spiking inequality, uh, you know, these fear of, you know, becoming mindless beasts. All this stuff is, you know, is very much a reflection. So I think it's probably likely that the original creators of these stories, and obviously it's very hard to find those in the ancient past, um, probably were, as, as Kira said, intentional. And then, you know, the ones that stuck around are the ones that reflected something in society that needed addressing. You know, in a lot of ways, horror is a genre of purity plays, right? And that doesn't mean that fantasy and, and sci-fi and stuff don't have that as well. But horror is very much like, look at the societal values and see what happens, right? I mean, even it goes down into like the, the 90s film Scream with... This whole idea where it's very meta and they have to follow certain rules about purity. In fact, virginity is one of those rules, right? So uh, you get like this interesting question of like, can you be a hero and still be a virgin, right? And what does that say about how we understand? Or not be a virgin. Or not be a virgin, right? Um, And so what does that say about our culture? So that's a lot of the stuff going on. Um, Lindsay asks, I really read something about monsters reflecting ableism, uh, demonic disability and ugliness or, uh, deformity. I think that's supposed to be deformity, demonified Demonified disability. Oh, uh, okay. Demonified disability and ugliness. What are your thoughts and what do you have suggestions on creating good monsters without praying to these tropes? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. So that's actually, there's a long history of that going back 
well, the earliest I can think of is like Marco Polo. Um, he wrote about these like monstrous humans. They're just people that looked different, obviously, than him. And so a lot of our monsters are these like disabled or deformed human shapes. So things like um, giants or cyclopses or those are the ones that come to mind, but these like grotesque human forms. Um, I think probably the best way to avoid that is to not have a human monster. Even um, ones like, the Wendigo's a little bit different, but a lot of times our monsters are like people with mental disabilities as well. But if you have something that's completely inhuman, like a kaiju or even something like a ghost, mm -hmm. something that doesn't have a human form, it's really easy to kind of avoid those like traps of grotesquerie that we tend to see with the the more ableist monsters. You could flip it too. You could make beauty an element of horror as well. I yeah, mean, you could do true. all kinds of fun stuff with it for sure. Uh, but yeah, that is a long history of difference. I mean, not just Marco Polo, but what Linnaeus in one of his five classifications, Homo monstrous, which was like a description of... Of a deformed species uh, of human. Yeah, mostly very from racist. mixed. Yeah, mostly from <laughs> mixed groups. So very, very ra racist. And we do talk about that a little bit in the in the, the race chapter. Um but yeah, that is a long history. And I think, you know, sometimes being cognizant of that um, uh, can simply be enough to kind of stave off some of those tropes. And you're looking at what does your monster look like? What is it, you know, um, uh, what features does it have uh, that um, uh, that might be reflecting, you know, uh, issues with uh, representation of a certain group, right? So, um, and that's something to be thinking about. And that's I, honestly one of the reasons we wrote this book is to address the, some of those representation issues that people, you know, um, uh, see with fiction. So, what other questions uh, do you have? Some great questions so far. We really appreciate it. Um, I guess while we're waiting for more questions, I'll just talk a little bit about the book. Like, we'll I'll do a chapter breakdown here for you. Um, so uh, we have uh, the first chapter is uh, thinking like an anthropologist to build better worlds. Second chapter is understanding culture. So you know what is this whole culture thing? Um, Chapter three, why the hell did they do that? Understanding the context, conditions, and choices made by people and fictional characters. And we did that chapter in part to um, talk about how do you understand difference and how do you create better characters, ones that are more dynamic and interesting and not, you know, wooden or two-dimensional. So, oh, we do have another question. Are there example uh, of monsters that are related to physical environment versus social environment or is your argument that all come from cultural discomforts? Ooh, that's a good one. No, there absolutely are. So um, the ones there are specific cultural discomfort monsters, but a lot of our monsters are more based in the physical environment than they are in the social environment. Like at, we were saying at the beginning of the chapter, the like when we're vulnerable, like the environmental spaces that make us vulnerable. So mm -hmm. monsters that attack us in the dark. That's an environmental discomfort because we, we can't see in the dark. We're a, a daylight species. Um, other ones like sea monsters and the shark from Jaws, all these monsters that come out of the water because we're not a water living species either. So a really broad section of our monsters as humans are these kind of environmental ones. Or even monsters just of lonely places like monsters that kind of lure you into the wilderness never to be seen again almost all cultures have that kind of creature mm -hmm. because that's something getting lost is a terrifying thing for us if you're separated from your group you'll probably die well and a huge portion of greek mythology surrounds the idea you go into the wilderness and you're screwed i mean that's a lot of it so um you know you're fine in the city but the second you go out into those woods you might encounter, you know, encounter like a centaur or perhaps one of the gods in disguise will come and mess with you or, you know, so um, one thing I think that's important to remember is that the way that we deal with the world or the, what culture is, is culture is an adaptation to our environment. Uh, not only our environment, but our social environment too, not just our physical. So it's a little bit of both things, right? Because yeah, I mean, there's cultural anxieties about the dark, but that comes from a biological place. 
So it's not as simple as either or. It's, it's kind of that whole back to that whole classic nature versus nurture argument. Um, humans are doing both things all the time. So good yeah. question, Joe. Very good question. So, all right, and as we're waiting for questions again, I'll just, you know, go through the chapters real quick. Um, chapter four is on genetics. Um, chapter five is on how natural selection works and doesn't. And we wanted to include a biological element of this book so that you could understand exactly how, you know, how do genetics impact how your world would look like if you tweak stuff and, and what is, I mean, also we wanted to include some uh, discussion of, you uh, uh, you know, um, what evolution is and how it works because it's such a big part of anthropology too. And a lot of humans, a lot of what we're doing as humans is also, you know, not only, uh, you know, we're adapting to our environment, but we're also adapting socially to the conditions of the environment. So, all right. Uh, Drew asked, what are your thoughts on race and Dungeons and Dragons? There's a lot of controversy right now with certain races in Dungeons and Dragons, which have roots in real world, world cultures and also, are you supposed to have evil chaotic alignments? How do you keep evil mooks without painting an entire <laughs> race as evil? Or is that a thing for too, too much of a thing to worry about as much as a dungeon, uh, dungeon too much master. as a dungeon master? Yeah, so they're doing a little better. Some of the earlier races, uh, there a lot of them have kind of the same origins as like the the orcs and the goblins and like Tolkien and stuff a lot of them had kind of problematic elements to start so like a lot of the the more like barbaric or evil races had features that were similar to like non-european cultures which is definitely problematic um i i think they are getting a little bit better and i know in some of the the newer versions like i've been reading about eberron and the the races aren't quite as like strictly aligned as they were before like they tend to blend and different races can have different motivations now so there's not quite as much of a like a cookie cutter kind of element to that well yeah and you know the one thing i w wanted you to think about too is that uh, look at um i you know my master's research worked with a theater troupe uh one of those members of the theater troupe she was oh, man she was just turning 90 as we were interviewing her and she did this walk during the Cold War across Ukraine, 100 Americans, 100 Russian, and I think there was a couple of other groups. They all walked together across the entire country of Ukraine over the course of uh, a month or two. And, um, you know, one thing she told me, the reason she did this, this walk is because she just wanted people to see that doesn't matter what nationality, what ethnicity, what they are, people are just people. You know, and so I think when we write fictional worlds where an entire group or entire race of creatures is naturally evil, that's lazy. It's lazy writing. It's very unrealistic because, you know, whether you're talking about someone who believes in communism or, uh, you know, maybe they are really a fan of, of uh, authoritarian, uh, authoritarian, you know, dictatorship. Maybe they benefit very greatly from that. That doesn't mean that they're not a person with like hopes and dreams, that they're not a person who, you know, may do amazing, kind, compassionate things one moment and turn around and be a, a jerk the next. I mean, people are people wherever they go and your writing should reflect that. You know, regardless of skin color, regardless of dialect, you know, we have uh, we write about I write we write about this in one of the language chapters uh, about how we have like these stereotypes about dialects. And if you think about like southern accents are considered stupid or British accents are considered highly intelligent. Right. And the reality is there's you know, there's no measure anywhere that says a certain IQ percentage is attributed to a certain dialect or anything. It doesn't work that way. So, you know. A lot of good, solid writing is making sure that your characters, even within their own cultures, are diverse. There's good characters there. There's bad characters there. And I think, you know, this idea of Dungeons and Dragons probably directly comes from Tolkien, which... A we, lot of it. A lot of it comes from Tolkien. And we do very much talk about, you know, don't do it like Tolkien. It was fine for that era. Tolkien obviously was a genius at world building, but he definitely was a pioneer in that field. And, you know, an orc is an orc is an orc is an orc in Tolkien. But if you're going to have 
orcs with, you know, siege engines and weaponry. They're going to have orc scholars and orc librarians and, you know, and of course, I know orcs are, are like cloned creatures in part, but still, you'd still have their variation even, even in that. I mean, if you clone a copy of me and Kira and you thrust them into a bunch of different experiences, they're still going to have some different inclinations, so... Yeah, you know. I actually, I know an excellent example of this, and it's from orcs specifically to kind of talk about that, that diversity. So in um, Unseen Academicals by Terry Pratchett, the main character is an orc. And orcs in that world, they were like a magically created killer species. So like the whole race was created as weapons of war. But, and so the, like the whole history, they were like, they've been genocided and killed and people tried to get rid of them. But there's an orc who finds his way to the, the capital city and he starts working at the university and he's a genius. And he's very smart and very sensitive. And the whole book is kind of about people realizing what he is and realizing that he is his own creature. He's not just this terrifying monster. He's a real person. So it's kind of completely flips that tropes in the same way, like same kind of Tolkien-esque thing. They're a species created for war, but they still have nuance and personality. Just not, they're not all cookie cutters. Right, right. Um you know, uh, and of course, you know, if you haven't, go read Terry Pratchett because we're both so big good. fans of Terry <laughs> Pratchett um, for good reason. Because everything he does in his fantasy tropes are satire of all the problems with fantasy tropes. So in the real know, world, in the real world too, <laughs> lots of great social commentary uh, in Terry Pratchett. Uh, the man was a, a genius for sure. So. Other questions. We have about um, 12 minutes left uh, for the live stream. Um, and, you know, of course, I said this at the beginning, but if you do have questions and you're watching this later on, do feel free to post questions in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them. I do try to at least, you know, check YouTube once or twice a week to, to see if anyone's posted questions uh, on my YouTube series, which is Anthropology or 10 or less. Uh, you know, which only has 11 episodes currently, but I got a couple more in the post-production as soon as I fix my laptop. <laughs> so, um, what else, what other questions do you have? And like I said, I'll read a couple more of the chapter titles here. Um, chapter seven's honoring the past, why cultures create myth, imagine past, and what it has to do with purity. Uh, chapter eight's language, the architect of culture. Uh, chapter nine, the things we make and leave behind. We did, that's a chapter dedicated to, to archaeology specifically, you know, thinking about cultural objects in your culture and society. Um, you know, what kind of objects should be around or shouldn't. Um, we have a chapter, bring out your dead, disease, populations, and medicine. So looking at health, wellness, all that kind of stuff. Um, chapter 11 is gender versus sex. Uh, chapter 12, race in history and imagination. Um, 13 is economics more than money or markets because there's a lot of other economic systems between, you know, we have this idea that capitalism and communism are like two economic systems, but they're actually one. They're both market-based systems and they're just variations on a theme. Uh, so we talk about, you know, um, foraging systems and, um, uh, and, uh, pastoralism and various other things. Um, chapter 14, kinship. Kinship, marriage, and sexuality, how we persist across time. 15 is what is government good for? Uh, political systems and social control. Chapter 16, studying the sacred, religion, and mysticism. Um, chapter 17 is violence, worthy victims, and war. Uh, chapter 18, invasion and expanding empire, understanding colonization. Chapter 19, the social webs we weave, globalization and culture. Uh, chapter 20 is ways of knowing and exploration of science and magic across culture. That was one of the most fun chapters to write. Cause we actually oh, take so like, fun. we take, took like fantasy elements from, from, you know, soft versus hard magic. You know, there's some great YouTube videos, uh, of soft versus, um, hard magic and hello future me. He has a great channel. Uh, and then also Brandon Sanderson did some great stuff. And then we compared that to real world magic systems. So, um, Kelly um, asks, what type of monsters do you think we will see arise from our current culture slash political class clashes? Oh, man, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, geez, I don't know. There's We've got so many fears right now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, look at uh, you know. I think I think there's a lot of cult fears right now, right? We have QAnon, the the crazy cult QAnon going on, right? And um, you have Scientology, and you have these very other cult things that are very much present. And then we have films like Midsummer that came out recently, right? And you yeah. see a lot of we see a lot of these. Um, uh, you know, and that kind of works on both sides. This, this idea of the the leftist or the rightist cult at the same time, right? Yeah. Um, so it, you know, there's this this fear of cults that kind of stretches on both sides here. Or um, fear you know, of conspiracy. Fear of conspiracy is a big one. Is a big one, yeah. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of fears right now. We have a lot of fears. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And of course, pandemics. Of course, right. So. Fear of others. I think agoria, agoraphobia is really on the rise because we've all been trapped in our houses. Yeah. So I, I feel like kind of probably both sides of that, like fear of things outside the home and then fear of getting trapped inside the home will probably yeah. pop up. Yeah. Well, there's been a, a rash of movies on like evil houses and technology too in the last couple of years. So, I mean, you really just have to look around what's going on in the culture and you'll, you'll see kind of stories of that. So... Uh, Lindsay asks, when building a culture, how do you give people some familiar associations, but also avoid riff ripping off or caricaturing another culture? For example, generic fantasy, fantasy worlds frequently have medieval Europe flavor. So what would you do if you wanted to break away from that? Um, I would, I don't know. Do you want to take that one? Sure. Or start um, with it? Yeah. So, so one thing you might consider is, uh, well, why does fantasy have to be medieval? I mean, we've got urban fantasy all over the place now. Um, so there's lots of uh, other opportunities. But what I suspect you're asking is about cultural difference uh, and uh, the idea of, well, how do you do a fantasy world in, say, ancient Japan and not do like cultural appropriation. And first of all, what you have to do is research. You definitely want to be researching about the trends, about how society worked. Um, you know, uh, you may want to talk to people from Japan in the modern era and see what the modern perceptions, um, if that's possible, uh, of that culture is. Um, you also want to, again, consider what we call agency in anthropology, this idea that uh, you're not going to just stereotype everybody, right? A person is a person is a person. You know, even in the, let's say, uh, and I grew up Catholic, and so I, I spent a lot of time in the Catholic Church. Uh, and, um, you know, amongst Catholics, there's different political views about every social issue, right? It's not just, just because you're Catholic, you believe in this thing. Well, there's a billion Catholics in the world. So... Of course, there's great variation. You know, there's regional variation. You know, certain groups have certain trends. But the most important thing to remember is that people are individuals. And so, you know, let's say you're doing samurai culture, uh, you know, may, you're going to have different kinds of samurai, right? They're not all going to be stoic warriors. You're going to have some people who maybe they're supposed to be, a, maybe there's a character that's supposed to be a samurai, you know, because he's a male and he's the, the eldest in the family. And then he finds himself completely inept at, uh, um, you know, with a sword, but he has this magical ability, right? So there's lots of ways you could, you can tackle that. But the most important thing is when you can check in on the culture, see what they think, look at what kind of media they make. How do they represent themselves? If you can interview people, but if, if you can't, because not everybody has access to be able to do that, read lots of books on history and culture. Um, you know, read a couple books on the ethnography of modern Japan and compare them to the classical historical texts. So, you know, we as, as writers and creators, we love to like create these worlds. And, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about it in terms of like, okay, well, I'm going to build a warp drive, but I want to engineer what's a realistic warp, warp drive, right? And so people will do research about that. They'll do research about how pandemics spread or how disease spread. Uh, Stephen King talks about for the stand, he did all kinds of background research on how disease works, right? But people, for whatever reason, don't want to research other cultures. Or don't want to consider that maybe we can ask the modern members of the modern culture what we're doing, um, you know, and it's, it's just another part of research. It's just part of the job as being a writer is, is doing that kind of research. So uh, it's incredibly important if you're going to be representing another culture to do it uh, as, as best you can. Um, and you should be writing diversely because society is diverse. 
So, you know, if you go to downtown Denver, we're, we're, uh, we're speaking from Denver here. If you go to downtown Denver, you're going to see people of all different ethnicities and backgrounds, right? So you, your culture should be diverse, especially if it's in a large location. Um, and, you know, even within your neighbors, like, it, you know, uh, in an apartment complex or on a block, you're going to have people with different inclinations, thoughts, feelings, all that stuff. And you should be attempting to capture that in all of your characters, which seems like a lot of work, but if you really want to write well, if you want to write honestly, then you have to you have to do diversity. You have to play with these ideas. So. Yeah, and you mentioned like give people familiar associations. The more familiar you as an author are with the worlds you're building and like with the concepts you're using to create them, the more of an anchor the readers will have. So like doing all this research, not only does it it helps you to like create this diverse world and create it authentically, but your surety will, will come across to the readers. So if you know what you're talking about and you've done this research, you can, yeah, you can create that anchor and create that sense of familiarity. So just because you're creating a fantasy world, it doesn't have to be completely alien because you as a person are writing it. So you will have that bridge and the, the readers can kind of follow you across that. And it makes the world more immersive. Like, it's easier to lose yourself in a well-crafted world that doesn't have a bunch of wooden stereotypes. It's so much easier to lose yourself because you say, man, you know, I didn't understand what it's like to be, a, you know, a blind person. But now, from this character's point of view, because maybe you sat down and you researched what it's like to be blind and all the various little things they have to do and deal with on a daily basis suddenly you're embodying that experience um you know um reading and writing is an act of of empathy it's it's we're trying to especially fiction right we're trying to understand one another and so if you're going to try to under, help people understand one another if you're going to create real characters that you know that you care about you want them to be you know well-written diverse characters for sure so we got about three minutes left. Any final questions? The delay is so weird. <laughs> the, the delay is weird. It's hard to get used to for sure. It's funny because we watch ourselves on, on screen talking, you know, so... Yeah, but Drew said uh, Brandon Sand Sanderson's BYU lecture series is incredible. 100% agree. So uh, definitely check it out. And then the Hello Future Me channel on, um, uh, you know, uh, talking about soft versus hard magic. They're, they're very good. And they also use a lot of, you know, good pop culture references like uh, Full Metal Alchemist or Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, Just Right is another great uh, YouTube channel. Uh, that one has a great video on how to build really good backstory with um, Avatar The Last Airbender. They have a really good one on Four Corner Opposition and John Truby's work. Um, uh, you know, kind of ditching the idea of the hero's journey and really making more dynamic characters. Um, and uh, he uses Batman Begins as kind of a starting point for Four Corner op Opposition. And it's it's just a great video. And um, between Hello Future Me and Just Right, those are fantastic channels uh for you know um, world building and considering writing craft and a lot kind of stuff and you know every time they come out with a new video i watch them so because <laughs> i think they're they're extremely useful and uh you know because um i mean i'm a published science fiction writer but i'm always trying to be better so um and that's the point of this book is is really um trying to be better about just building the world for your characters to thrive in and the really cool thing about uh, and that we tried to do really well with this book is, you know, giving you the architecture so that the, the so that writing your characters is easier. Because if you have a really well established world and you throw a character into it, then they have their values, thoughts and ideas mixing with the cultural system in place. And so naturally conflict arises. You know, it's, it's easier to have conflict if your world is really authentically built. Um it looks like we're just about out of time. So again, if you have questions in the future and you're watching this in the future, feel free to uh, ask questions in the comment section. And um, 
Uh, if you guys are interested in us doing another Q&A, uh, you can certainly put that in the, the comment section. We'd be happy to do that again. Uh, we're recording on, uh, I don't know when it's present, when it's actually going live, but we're recording a podcast, uh, This Anthropological Life, uh, coming up here May 17th is when we're actually doing the recording. Um, and uh, you can certainly follow us uh, on social media. Um, we're all over the place. Uh, I have my website, liridianslaboratory.com. Uh, and uh, of course, on this YouTube channel, uh, you can find my stuff. So, um, so yeah, there's lots of places to, to, to find out where we're going. Uh, my website also has a newsletter sign up if you're interested about upcoming events uh, that me and Kira or just Kira or just me are, are doing. So we've got a couple of things coming up for sure this summer, a couple of recordings. So um, uh, yeah, so stay tuned and check out Build Better Worlds, an introduction to... Um, uh, anthropology for game designers, fiction writers, and filmmakers. It's a long title, so sometimes I get it mixed up. <laughs> um, and it, again, right now, it's on uh, uh, Amazon for just four ninety nine. It's normally nine ninety nine for Kindle, or the Kindle version. So it's half off for a little while. So uh, have a great day. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. We sincerely appreciate it. So Yes, thank you, guys. Uh, have a great day.